So today、um, we have Robin、uh, for our meet the mentor session. Robin is a new mentor on Masters.、Uh, her group will start on March six.、Uh, today, Robin will show us a demo and talk about her painting process. In the end, we'll have a Q and A session.、Uh, a quick introduction of Robin. Robin Askini studied illustration at Sheridan College in Toronto and art and design at Parsons, the new school in New York. After pursuing a commercial art career for over a decade, she completed the classical drawing and painting program at the Academy of Realist Art and has since worked full time as a painter and art instructor. She has won numerous awards for her paintings from the Society of Canadian Artists, Federation of Canadian Artists. Canadian Portrait Society, Bold Brush, and the Art Renewal Center. Recently, she exhibited in New York at the Soma Gandhi Club's Open Figurative Exhibition and the Dashia Gallery 13th Anniversary Group Exhibit. Her work is held in private collections internationally. Welcome, Robin. Thank you so much, Yuteng, for the introduction.、Um, so yes,、yeah, so I want to share with you、uh, a painting process video.、Um, so this is one that I've done、uh, from my disrupted realism series.、Um, it's actually a painting of an eye, and you'll see how I start off with more abstract brushstrokes. And、um, I don't really, you know, for for this type of drawing, especially when I'm working on something so small, this is like an Eight by eight canvas.、Um, I tend to go into it right away and be a little bit more experimental with my drawing process.、Um, you'll see here. I'll just kind of speed up a little bit.、Um, so you'll see when I'm laying down paint strokes, I'm using a much bigger brush,、um, and I'm just kind of figuring out shapes,、um, especially along the way. So you're seeing sort of this eye that's. Kind of emerging.、Um, I want to add, you know, some some textures、um, and colors initially to just get a sense of, you know, how、um, sort of my my color palette, especially at this stage of the game.、Um, and what I'm trying to do, especially to get more of a like an interesting kind of gestural quality to it, is again using kind of these、uh, bolder brushstrokes that are.、Um, You know, a, a little bit wavy.、Um, I I don't know if you've seen sort of my recent painting collection, but、um, I'm kind of incorporating these like large, bold, abstract brushstrokes、um, with realism. And so, you know, part of that、um, is is definitely figuring out how to sort of lay down initial brushwork and figuring that out kind of in the early stages、um, using kind of a big, bolder brush. And then after that, I'm going to go into more、um, more detail. So you'll see now I'm incorporating a few more different colors.、Um, yeah, I think at this stage of the game too, it's all about yeah figuring out composition.、Um, a lot of my compositions、uh, I I figure out maybe on computer. Before I dive into it, sometimes I'll print out a reference photo to just have beside me, and other times I'll、uh, just have my computer screen next to me with a reference photo, and I'll use that. And actually, working from a computer screen is something that I do pretty often, and it is nice because it has a little bit more flexibility. So if I do want to change an image, or if I take a bunch of reference photos and then decide, oh, okay, well, I'm having a little.、Um, You know, I'm not quite sure what's happening, sort of in this image. Maybe I want to、uh, have a look at the other images as part of like, or the other photos that I've taken as part of that series, and you know, swap out the reference photo for a particular、um, particular feature, possibly like a hand or an eye.、Um, that kind of allows me the flexibility to do that、um, and pretty quickly. So, yeah, I tend to work pretty fast.、Um, so all of You know, you'll see, even just getting down some initial paint strokes like this,、um, you'll see the the image kind of coming together fairly quickly. I think the whole process for this eye painting took about, um, I would say like six six hours. Uh, this this video is a little sped up, so you'll see more um, more painting, um, more fast painting throughout the video.
<laughs> so do you uh, also have an idea of composition even for a small painting of just an eye? Yeah, so I'll usually have the reference photo and then I'll I'll have a few, um, either I'll have some like a color palette beside it or some just big gestural strokes that I want to incorporate into it. Um, sometimes I'll put the two together already in Photoshop and just work from like a composite image of a few, you know, a few different references that I've sourced. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think for this one, I had sort of the eye and then I had a few different, um, gestural brush strokes next to it to, to, um, to just give me an idea of what I wanted to achieve for this. And yeah, for this color palette too, I, I did prime the canvas with sort of like a, uh, like a softer, I guess like pinky pinky beige I guess in acrylic and I tend to prime my canvases in acrylic first um it just ends up being a faster drawing process and especially with these like wood panels I think this is like one of these ampersand wood panels so what's what's really nice is they actually come pre-primed um so I don't have to sort of you know put a clear gesso uh, or any sort mm -hmm. of gesso on it first before going in with like an acrylic base layer and I just feel like it helps uh, maybe move the, the drawing process and the painting along quicker before then I, I go in either with acrylic or oil. I think most recently I've been doing um, more oil. So this painting, for example, I did a, an acrylic base layer, but I did go in with, um, I am going in with oil. Mm -hmm. and oil yeah. Yes, yeah, very interesting. Uh, you use a lot of fun brush because I don't see like figurative painters use that brush that much, not at the earlier phase. Yeah, exactly. So I, again, I've been experimenting with a few brushes. Um, sometimes I'll use like larger brushes. I think, you know, in my technical training, I've only used fan brushes to uh, reduce glare or just do uh, ever so slight blending and maybe some facial features just to um, kind of, ease the transitions from one tone, like one sort of, uh, color to another. Um, but in this case, uh, yeah, I was kind of experimenting with these big fan brushes and I think they give a pretty interesting, uh, kind of brush stroke and texture, especially if you, if you leave it alone. Um, yeah, so it, it's a different way again to, um, to kind of add these more gestural brush strokes, but keep it a little bit looser too at the beginning. I don't want to tighten up so quickly. I do want to give it a little bit of a chance to develop on its own um, and to kind of give me some surprises. Like I don't sometimes always like knowing exactly how it's going to turn out in the end. I do want to, especially for these small paintings, I do want to leave a little bit of room for me to interpret the photo that I'm working from. Mm -hmm. um, or to kind of uh, include these really interesting brush strokes so that, you know, when you look at it, it's not just a painting of an eye, but there's so much kind of more going on to it. And I think that's why having like a good understanding of composition too uh, is so key, especially when you're starting up these smaller paintings too. Like you really want to make sure at least on the outset that you're placing the eye in a very specific place so that the whole composition kind of holds together more clearly. So, I mean, that's something that I've done to, uh, to like during my illustration and design career too. Um, so I, I did work for, as a commercial artist for a while before then, uh, doing drawing and painting pretty much full time now, um, as mm -hmm. well as teaching. So, yeah, so I, I think, uh, even, I think that's one of the similarities too, between commercial art and, uh, and fine art is, you know, both of those, you really need to have a solid sense of composition, but you also have to really understand how colors can work together uh, mm -hmm. and complement each other, right? So for example, I made a conscious decision for this, that it would be more of like a purple yellow kind of color contrast mm -hmm. um, and maybe incorporating some beiges too, to keep it a little bit true to nature, right? Because of the skin mm -hmm. tone around the eye. Um, but yeah, I think I had fun in terms of like the coloration behind this, right? Like I was playing a lot with, you know, composition, but then how all of these colors and values interact with each other, um, and, and kind of giving it a little bit of space to breathe around those brushstrokes too. Yeah. Enjoying the video? 
Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to be notified when new Masteries videos are added. I think at this stage, the purple looks really <laughs> kind of really all vibrant. Different. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I've seen the finished painting of this, like everything just fit together. You don't feel any color jumping out too much. So Thank if, you. yeah, that's what you're saying. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's a little, I think for this, especially like my smaller paintings, I do like this more organic process. And yeah, it's interesting to see, especially in this stage, I'm almost just placing down colors to give myself a reference for, okay, maybe here I'm going to do something blue or here I'm going to do something. Mm. Cool. So just placing those brush strokes, I think is so, um, so important for me, I think in these types of paintings, because again, it gives me a sense of, uh, what values are going to be included. Um, and then it, it helps me conceptualize where I want to go for the whole painting too. Yeah. So um, is this color scheme uh, similar, like how close uh, is your photo reference to your painted color? Uh, it depends. In this case, not very close at all. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm working from a live eye painting and so that uh, tends to have more browns and beiges. Um, and I did find some references that I actually color corrected for these abstract brush strokes. So those I color corrected to be more purple, which I thought, you know, added like an interesting element to. Um, okay. Looks yeah. like we have someone joining us. Sharon? Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah, so I was just explaining my, uh, my painting process. This is a, a demo that I did. Um, maybe like a few months ago. So uh, I'm really going from these abstract brush strokes to, uh, to kind of create this, you know, a, a sort of feel out my composition before I then go in and start refining, um, re refining all my brush strokes. Yeah. If you have questions, feel free to ask along the way. Yeah, so you'll notice for something like this, I'll I'll sometimes use even like paper towels to go into it, um, to push mm -hmm. it full at this stage. So I decided, okay, maybe it's a little bit too heavy on the top, um, in terms of the color. So I remove some of that, and and that's actually one of the beauties of working in oil, and one of the reasons that I enjoy working in oil so much is that because of the slow drying time, it really does mm -hmm. allow more flexibility for figuring out compositions. Um, yeah. Cause yeah, you can definitely push and pull a lot without the paint actually drying. So you have more time to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, so you mentioned at this stage, uh, you're just putting down color as an indication of maybe the, what kind of color you want at which, which location. So it's more a consideration of uh, composition. Um, are you very careful about the value of the color at a specific spot or that kind of loose at this stage as well? If anything, I'm like more concerned about the value than I am of the color, to be honest. I think if you mm -hmm. have the right value, it'll kind of hold, the piece will hold together regardless of what color you're choosing. So as long as it, it's sort of harmonious in color um, and you have a color hierarchy between where you want to draw, a, you know, the viewer's attention, um, having the right value is so, so important because it, it then reads as more three-dimensional, right? Or it yeah. then reads as uh, having more depth if you're so conscious about the value. And I think that was one of the reasons too, why I, why I made that decision to remove this purple element mm -hmm. up here. I just felt like the value was too dark for it to be so close to the side of the canvas. Um, so in that case, I wanted the values to be much darker, like towards the middle of the eye, right? Where the eyebrow is, where that, um, the, the eyelid is, even like that red accent where the, 
the lash line is, right? I, I want the right. viewer to really be drawn into the center of the composition. And you'll see when I put down the pupil too, that it's, um, it really makes a big difference, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, we can speed it up a little bit so you can kind of see where I'm, I'm going with this. Um, so yeah, you'll see here now I'm using smaller brushes. Um, I'm definitely going into, you know, a more precise application of paint and you're going to see that I'm kind of turning sort of the eye. So I'm using a darker value in the corner and then lighter values as I get closer to the pupil. Right. Yeah. And I'm being and very conscious too, like how, like the coloration, right? I want it to be a little bit more cool and blue where the eye is. And then around the skin tone to have a warmer, um, mm -hmm. a warmer hue. Mm -hmm. So at the very beginning, um, I see you put down the darkest dark for this piece. Yeah. Uh, I think that's your anchor point. Exactly. So I, I like putting down my darkest darks and lightest lights pretty early on because I think that gives me a good um, a good value range. I understand, you know, I don't want to go darker than whatever the darkest dark is anywhere else in my painting because I want the viewer's attention to be drawn to that uh, spot immediately. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and you'll notice that I'm, I think the lightest light will eventually. Uh, I, I mean, I think the the light the light of the background is actually quite light. That's probably like a two or three on the value scale. If we're thinking of one being the lightest and 10 being the darkest, mm. but um, I think the brightest lights in this piece are going to be the highlights on the eye, which I only obviously put at the end. And I think what's really interesting about thought, thought, like adding these value contrasts is like, um, and especially to draw somebody's eye into the part of the painting that you want them to see first is you want your values, your darkest dark and lightest light to almost be next to each other. And that mm. high value contrast will help draw the viewer's eye in. So in a lot of instances, I'm just really concerned about, you know, value and how the, all those values in the piece are relating to each other. Yeah. Yeah. So this is about like halfway into the painting process. So I've made like a lot of these kind of decisions. Okay. How am I, you know, where is every, so now everything is sort of placed in the right area. I'm kind of happy with how the colors are integrating with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I'm, I'm kind of getting into smaller brushes and, you know, smoothing certain parts out. Um, kind of thinking a little bit more about, you know, shape in this case and, and rendering form. Yeah. Yeah. At this point, I really can see the inside corner of the eye kind of turning in. Yeah. Even though the iris is not even there yet, but uh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So now, now I think I'm making a decision as to how to get that iris in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I am so, I think because of, um, my training as a realist artist, um, you know, it is sometimes, difficult to um just create form but like once you understand how to create shape and form then you can kind of play around with it which adds which kind of creates this more at least in my case this more kind of disrupted realist feel mm -hmm. right I don't want to render everything hyper realistically um to me like as as beautiful as that is and you know there's a few artists out there who can do incredible you know realistic work. It, I, I personally feel that it adds more interest if you have your own sort of artistic take on sort of the realism, right? Like what, yeah. what colors do you want to use to evoke maybe an emotion or how are you using your values to create like more interest, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it becomes a little bit more personal, um, in this approach and, yeah. um, and I mean, you, you do that same type of work, you know, same type of work, right? So it, yeah. it becomes, you know, you are grounded in reality, which is really nice. And you have to understand shape and form and value and hue and chroma and all of those technical aspects of color and mm -hmm. form. But then by having more of these, 
you know, abstract brushstrokes, it just adds a little bit more interest uh, to the piece, right? And it kind of creates yeah. something a little bit more unique. Yeah. Actually, while we're talking about it, I'm curious about your story finding this way of expression. Like, how did they come to you? Yeah, honestly, that's a great question. Um, I think, I mean, I've always enjoyed abstract art. Like, I love... Mm -hmm you know, Gerhard Richter's work. I love Rothko's work. I like Cy Twombly's work. Like I love abstract painting, but on the other hand, I also love classical realist painting. Like I love Rembrandt. I love Sargent. I love, you know, all of these other, you know, fantastic painters and, um, you know, Jenny Saville, right. And like mm -hmm. seeing how, um, all of, you know, trying not to restrict myself to one form of art and seeing how all my interests can maybe combine into something that feels very me and that feels a little bit more unique with something that I've always kind of strived for. Um, you know, I've kind of, I've always oscillated, I think, back and forth between doing the realism and then doing more abstraction or doing, um, even mm -hmm. like in my design work, I worked a lot, you know, creating graphics out of geometric shapes mm -hmm. and, I think both sort of started to influence each other, like being in, being in like an academic atelier doing, you know, copies of Rembrandt's and doing Barg drawings and doing all of this more academic training and then wanting to almost break three of that, free of that after, you know, four years of doing that. I, I thought that I, my skills were good enough in terms of those you know, I, I had a sort of a full enough toolbox of academic training that I did want to explore a little bit more. So it definitely was more of a conscious decision. Um, I think I did start more of this abstraction maybe a year ago. Um, so it is, it is fairly new for me, but, um, and it's exciting because I, I want to explore it much more, right. I've, I've done a lot of, you know, more classical, realist pieces but um this feels this feels more like me this feels like a combination of all my kind of lived experiences and my art interests yeah so your current style is it because um certain tool you explore that lead to this or I mean I definitely think that having had that like illustration and design training like I'm so used to working uh combining things like on either Procreate or using Photoshop. So I've used a lot of digital tools, hmm. almost try things out before then spending the time and committing to painting something. Um, so by, by kind of um, doing these like digital collages, uh, using different, I don't know, like bits and pieces of, reference photos that I've taken, or maybe even bits and pieces of other people's work, just to kind of see how a certain element that I've introduced to a reference photo interacts with it. So I've, I've done a lot of that experimentation and, and through that, um, I think I found this, this particular voice, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, you'll um, see now I'm very much like refining the- yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I wasn't paying attention for five minutes and now, wow, <laughs> it's, uh, really coming into life. Right. Yeah. And especially over here, it's it really, um, edge quality for me is so important, right? Mm -hmm. It is something that I, I definitely consider both in the abstract work as well as the realist work, like making sure certain things are softer, making sure that certain things have a harder edge. Um, you don't want abstract brushstrokes with like an extremely hard edge to it either, because then it distracts maybe from, uh, the subtlety that you're getting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, here, I'm just trying to, again, smooth certain parts out, do a little bit more blending. It's always, I find it's always so challenging figuring out how much to blend too. Um, in, in this particular piece, I wanted kind of a gradation to be uh, very tightly rendered, especially where the eye, the, the iris was, and then to slowly uh, gradate the, or like to have more rougher textures 
on the um, on the sides of the canvases. Yeah, especially um, if you want to leave certain parts more expressive, more abstract, and it is <laughs> you almost need to pay attention to how much you blend at every stage. Exactly, you really do. But that's the nice thing about oil is that, like, I think oil lends itself so well to this type of like exploration too. Mm. Like, you want it to be a little bit more open ended. Like, I love this kind of exploration process, and doing this type of painting is so fun because, yeah, you have an idea of like where you want to go, but you're making so many decisions during the course of it that you really don't know what the outcome is going to be, and that that is exciting to mm. me, right? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, like my bigger pieces, I'll, I'll definitely plan them out more. Maybe I'll do like a color study too, um, just to really make sure that all the colors are, are harmonious. Um, and those paintings usually take me maybe like two or three weeks, depending on the size of it. But doing something like this, if it's a day, um, and it's it just is so fun to experiment with uh, with different yeah. types of strokes and and to have a little bit more like of an open ended. Uh, artistic process mm -hmm. yeah and here I'm experimenting with like different brushes so like to your point I'm using fan brushes I'm using uh, filberts too for blending um I'm using rounds to just add a little you know highlight here and there so yeah it's fun to experiment with different brushes and see how you can get different effects from those, but again, still kind of creating harmony with your brush application, right? Or have some sort of uh, rationale to why you're using a certain brush. Mm -hmm. And I love, I like talking about that too. I mean, I just did a workshop at the Academy of Realist Art this weekend. Um, and we talked a lot about choosing which brushes to achieve which effects, um, which is so important. And then we talked about, yeah, like value and color, and uh, how softening edges can really help create, create, you know, a realistic form, right? Yeah. Yeah, and this part's, you know, again, it's really fun. You're just kind of pushing and pulling. Um, I know in this area, like where an eye kind of recedes and where the shadow should be just based mm -hmm. on all my more academic training, right? So especially in the crease of the eye, I wanted that to be, especially like that upper eyelid here, I wanted that to be really dark, right? Because especially if, you know, you're, I'm trying to figure out, okay, well, if the light source is coming from here, then maybe this area is going to be a little darker. So it's all, it is yeah. understanding maybe where the light is coming from and like hypothesizing, okay, well, if the light is coming from here, maybe then, you know, this area that's, that's so turned away from it, that's going to be one of my darkest darks mm -hmm. and to kind of approach it. Um, yeah, approach it a little bit more thoughtfully as opposed yeah. to, okay, let's just be a slave to the photo and copy all of these light elements and all of these dark elements. Cause again, like using photos, it can distort your, like photos are great for understanding shape and, you mm -hmm. know, photos take such um, yeah, getting a good photo reference, like, I, and even the impressionists use photo references for, you know, getting shapes right of their, of their models. Right. But what photos tend to distort is a lot of color. So mm -hmm. you can't necessarily trust your photos, um, for color. Like you, a lot of that, you have to almost like make up a little bit when it comes to, uh, to kind of creating artwork from a photo and even values. Sometimes like you get photos where an area is like really blown out. So you don't really have that much understanding of that light area and how the light yeah. turns around a surface. Um, and in contrast, like it could make an area really dark and flat where there could be a lot more information there. So, um, as, as great as photography is, it does have its limitations, which is why, you know, having a, having an understanding of light and value, um, and doing a lot of like life drawing too, is so helpful. And it, it did enable me to do this type of work because in one sense, yes, it is like playful and abstract, but in another mm -hmm. sense, like it is, it is deeply rooted in, uh, art theory and academic sort of training in that way. Mm 
Yeah. So if I hear you right, you're saying um uh you need to make up what the photo is missing with your experience and then the past practice. Exactly. Um, and then all also the knowledge of uh like basically combining what you see and what you know. Exactly. And and that I think that's the most challenging part, especially for realist artists, because yeah, when you're starting out and when you're starting to draw using photo references, you almost become a slave to the photo, right? You almost you want to copy that photo exactly. But sometimes copying a photo exactly doesn't really translate as well in paint or graphite as it does in that photo reference, right? Yeah. So it, it really depends on how you're using the photo. Like you want it to work for you in some ways mm. and, and, you know, not being a slave to a photo too ends up, um, I don't know, it gives you a little bit more flexibility, but I think that comes with a lot of, yeah, practice too. You have to understand where those limitations lie Mm -hmm. uh, in photography and how to break them and how to um, explore and be more creative sort of in the context of an image that's, you know, of a photograph, right? Of something lifelike that was taken and isolated, right? You want to be yeah. able to understand like where that light source is coming from and, you know, what you should keep versus what you, what you might want to explore. Mm -hmm. And all of those are like, uh, like oftentimes it really depends on your intention, right? Like, do you, do you want to stay so true to life or how much do you want to deviate from life? And if you do want to stay true to life, like what can you get away with in terms mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. making it more abstract? Yeah. So, yeah. So in this case, I'm paying, like, just going back to the video, I'm paying a lot more of it, uh, like attention to, yeah, especially the underside of the eye, using much smaller brushes now, um, really kind of getting that that turning in the in the eye and the iris, and then the bottom of the lid. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah, I, I love this way of painting. It's just it it feels so expressive, and um, and now it's like yeah, now maybe the 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 initial separations of color that I had, right. That big purple brushstroke mm -hmm. here and then that, that big blue brushstroke here. Now it's starting to feel a little bit more integrated. Yeah. I yeah. More context, right. And just softening that highlight. Yeah. I'm paying a lot of attention to edges here. Hmm. What to soften, what to make harder. Yeah, I have a few brushes that are really good for just blending and doing the, these things um, in particular. Do you clean your brush very often? Yeah, or so I, I actually always hold like a little towel. Um, I, I use these like blue shop towels that you can get at mm -hmm. Fire or some hardware stores. And I'll use those. Um, yeah, I'll often like maybe cut them up. So I'll have a small just towel in my hand and pretty much after every brush stroke, I'll wipe my brush on the towel so that I can reuse that brush in a different color. Um, I'm pretty bad about, you know, using the same brush for multiple <laughs> colors. Like I don't have necessarily one brush for one color. And when I was doing more academic work, I did. Um, but now I, you know, now I kind of am a little bit more loose because I know how much pigment I need in order to, uh -huh. how much pain I need in order to not, you know, create muddiness in my yeah. painting and to keep it like still looking fresh. And that's the thing about these paintings too, especially the brushstrokes is like, I, I'm so conscious about keeping it like light and fresh. I think that to me is, is so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I also noticed, even though your brush stroke is very expressive, but it kind of follows the form. For example, the uh, near the end of the eye, the outer corner of the eye, it kind of curls back to the uh, this arch bone. 
A hundred percent. And I think that's, again, that's another aspect of, you know, your academic training or even looking at artists like Sargent, for example, like all of his brushstrokes um, reinforce the forms that he he's trying to create. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's like another tool to like help create form is through the angle of your brush. Right. Mm. And so like looking down, for example, on the cheek, right. So if you have a brush that kind of follows that, that cheek or follows that muscle underneath the eye, um, it again, helps reinforce that form and that, uh, that musculature and, and, um, even some of like the facial anatomy that you want to get. Yeah. So that's another thing that I'm, that I'm going to talk about too. in in my mastery's course is, uh, there's a lot of anatomy, like I tend mm-hmm. to paint a lot of figures, right? So um, I think understanding head structure um, and the muscles and bones of the face are so important to creating more of this like lifelike, um, these lifelike images. Yeah. yeah. Actually, let's talk about the uh, mentorship group a little bit. Um, so what can people kind of (laughs) get? Yeah. So I, uh, so my, my profile is, is listed more as a generalist. Um, and I think I have a few different sets of skills, which I think could be helpful to people taking my, uh, um, my mentorship sessions. So first off, um, yes, more like academic drawing and painting. So definitely reinforcing like head structure and form. Um, also, you know, brush technique, how to kind of create different effects using different brushes. That's something that I really enjoy doing. And I think, you know, there's mm-hmm. maybe four or five major types of brushes. So I'll talk about um, the benefits and maybe shortfalls of using certain brushes for certain things. Um and then also color theory. I'm I'm so big on um really I think color theory is uh is so so important. Understanding your values and your value hierarchy in a painting. Um and then un- also understanding uh levels of chroma, so how intense a color should be. Mm. Uh, and then lastly, understanding like your hue. So what color uh is a green, is a purple, is a blue. And I think you can be a little bit more flexible with your hue, right? Like so I'm using a lot of purples here. Yeah. And obviously in a face, there's maybe not as much purple as what I'm using here. But I think you can be much more flexible in your hues if you have a strong understanding of value and chroma. Mm-hmm. So um so that's definitely something that I'm going to dive into uh from more of like a technical standpoint. Um then I I mean coming from commercial design and also now exhibiting in some galleries, um, I definitely can, uh, want to talk about maybe the marketing part of it. Um, if you are an emerging artist and want to apply to get into galleries, um, I can, you know, help you, um, kind of better understand what galleries to approach, how to approach them, maybe what kind of shows would be appropriate, um, to like, maybe starting with some group shows, um, Mm-hmm. which of those might be appropriate for your artistic career, how to build your CV, right? Um, yeah, and then obviously like the social media stuff. So like how to use Instagram and Facebook um, and those tools in order to uh, better your art career. Um, you know, maybe we can talk about hashtags, um, how to kind of grow your social media following. Um, I've done art fairs in the past too. So, you know, especially during art fairs, that's like a great way to sort of meet, um, your audience or like potential buyers of your work. So we can talk about how to, you know, possibly apply for, and then exhibit your work in an art fair. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of avenues actually that I've explored for my own work. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think, you know, because, I've, I've sort of been doing this for the past like three, four years. Um, it's still really top of mind. And, you know, I, I, I do understand, I do have a really strong understanding of like all of the struggles that I had when I was first starting out. So I'm hoping that, that, that makes me a little bit more empathetic when it comes to helping other emerging artists sort of figure it, figuring out what their direction might be. Um, because again, it wasn't so long ago that I was in that place too, 
So I'm hoping that, um, yeah, in terms of marketing and technique, um, and just kind of getting your work out there and finding your audience, um, I'd like to touch on all of that during my mentorship sessions. Yeah. That all sounds good. I kind of <laughs> didn't want to dig into it straight away because I'm definitely probably like three, four years where you were three, four years ago. Um, and then still trying to kind of get a feel of everything because there are a lot of things. It's very overwhelming at the beginning. And they uh, which one should be my priority, right? We we all have just limited time and uh, energy. Um, and then how not to burn yourself out while being progressing to your goals. Um, I found that sometimes more important than what I can, like, what I can do because there are so many things you can do. I think that's the biggest struggle and something that I struggled with often when I sort of was in your shoes is like, what do I do? Do I put all my eggs into like one basket? Do I, you know, prepare a whole bunch of pieces for this one particular art show? Do I um, write a hundred letters to galleries and, you know, try to get into a gallery that way? Do I just spend time working in my studio on my pieces and hope I just get discovered. Like there, there's so many yeah. avenues um, to, to sort of become a professional artist and like certain mm -hmm. things work for certain people. Right. Yeah. yeah. But I think you, I think just in terms of like how to get your work out there and how, like which eyeballs, you want to actually see your work. I think those things are so important. And yeah, it does take a little bit of trial and error at first, right? Like you have to mm -hmm. sort of see, like actually one thing that I really um, found helpful for me was um, signing up for the artist project last, a couple of years ago, last year. No, mm -hmm. last year. So I signed up for the artist project and that like really propelled my career in some ways because mm -hmm. I had created a body of work um, to exhibit like all together. Um, I really wanted to sort of treat that show as almost like a solo show. Mm -hmm. And during the course of me making those paintings, I sort of found, uh, I sort of found my voice. I had a coherent body of work that, um, I sort of was working for up to a year before me actually exhibiting. And, um, uh, and I think that allowed me a lot of that, that gave me a lot of focus. Right. So when I, I didn't allow myself to necessarily get extra, like distracted, I had like one clear goal at that time, which was, okay, now that I've like done some group exhibits, I've showed, um, in a few like reputable places. Now I'm going to kind of invest, um, in buying sort of an art booth and, uh, at least in Canada, that's sort of one of the biggest, uh, independent art fairs. Mm -hmm. So, what's, what's nice about that is, uh, a lot of like, and there's a lot of traffic. There is like, I think about 10,000 people who pass by during those four days during that weekend. Um, and yeah, I just, I got so much feedback, uh, both negative and positive uh, about my yeah. art. Um, but I think it helped solidify, okay, who is my audience? What are people gravitating towards? How do I, how do I still, um, maybe in the future, continue doing what I love to do, but also mm -hmm. um, finding a way to create work that other people can also relate to um, yeah. or that draws people in. Right. So mm -hmm. I think I had a lot of, I probably even had like more questions after doing that type of show <laughs> than, than answers. But I think that by sitting with it, um, and then almost taking that time after the show to experiment a little bit more, I did come across this series, uh, this more disrupted realist series that I've, I started working on and I'm so grateful that I did. And I think part of me getting my work out there and getting that sort of feedback, uh, did result in creating this series. Right. And yeah. figuring out, um, yeah, that I wanted, I wanted to be a little bit more expressive 
with it. And even though I'm still like really proud of some of the work that I did in the past, mm -hmm. right. That, that looks a little bit more academic. Um, I think taking it in, in this direction, um, for me, it seems more sustainable. Like I feel like I can kind of create these types of paintings long-term. It feels more natural to me mm -hmm. uh, and it's fun. Right. So I, I want to be inspired when I go into the studio, I want to have fun, but still like create work that other people like. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's definitely a balance. It's not black and white. It's not, oh, I have to be just true to myself or I have to cater to the market. It's that um, balance that work for you. Totally. And for every artist, it's different, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah. um, I mean, at this, at this point in time too, like I spent about 50% of my time either packing my work for art shows that I want to send it to yeah. or responding to emails or posting on social media or creating video reels or writing messages to galleries. Like I find all of, all of that takes up like 50% of my time. And then I, I carve out hopefully like six hours a day, five days a week in order to be able to do my painting, because that is not only something that like I really enjoy, but it's crucial to me growing as an artist. And right, uh, right. that's yeah. your that that's our bloodline. It is. It is. If you don't have work, then <laughs> and that's the thing. Like I, I feel like artists always have to keep producing. Right, you can't stagnate. Mm -hmm. Like even on days that I don't feel have been so productive in terms of studio days, as long as I've put a paintbrush to a wood panel or like a paintbrush to a canvas, I always feel like I'm getting somewhere, right? I'm figuring things out, I'm problem solving, um, I'm figuring out kind of what the next idea is. And I think you kind of have to devote that time in order to generate those ideas. Yeah. Do you have uh, moments when you don't know what to paint? Uh, Sometimes, but not recently, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> I, so in this new series that I'm working on, um, a lot of the photographs that I'm using as reference are all photographs of, you know, friends of mine or mm. girls that I know, um, or girls who have reached out to me who want to be painted. So like, oh, nice. I actually have a huge archive now of photos um, from those photo shoots that I've done. Um, and what I really love about that is that you know, for every photo shoot, there's maybe two or 300 photos that'll take. Mm -hmm. So I never really feel at a loss or like when I'm looking for something to paint, I'll just go back into those archives and mm -hmm. take a look at, okay, I really like this pose. Maybe if I combine this pose with this gesture or this like type of brush work, maybe that could create like for an interesting type of composition. So it's, you know, I, I definitely, um, it's kind of like a push and pull because I'll, I'll sort of have an idea often of like, what do I, what I want to achieve in the photo shoot for a particular model. And then I'll take the photos, but then I'll have those photos influence me, uh, as to what my next painting should be. Mm. And I do love portraiture too. I think it's, um, and just painting the human body for me is just so interesting. Like I always find something new or like a different shape of an eye or a different, like, angle of a nose like all of those are just really interesting like forms to play with for me mm -hmm. because like there are smaller complexities like smaller yeah. complex areas to play with and then these like kind of larger more big forms so I don't know I I, I find like I'm I'm at least like for now I, I'm pretty inspired by um just painting like the female figure especially yeah I think, I think that's one area I'm interested in learning, like working yeah. with models and then have a big archive of uh, just raw materials. And then, because uh, I think that's one challenging for figurative artists. It's like, I think you reference photo inform the finished painting. I think uh -huh. originality is start from there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And then not only are you being creative in your photography process and like choosing, like that's all creative too, like choosing your model, choosing your lighting, choosing what kind of like camera angle you want. Mm -hmm. right? All of those are part of that creative process. 
and like an extension of, of you and how you want to, yeah, create what kind of images you want to create. So, yeah, I, I mean, I'm during the, the mastery uh, mentorship, I'm, I'm happy to kind of go through, uh, the challenges of taking photos. Like I'm not a professional photographer and I, I don't claim to be, but I've, I think for art purposes, I've, I've figured out certain things that work and certain things that don't. So mm -hmm. I'm also happy to share, um, any, any sort of information I have, or, you know, even during, actually during my workshop last weekend, we went through, uh, the, some do's and don'ts of photography and how to light your model in ways that almost help you. Um, yeah. so, you know, with one, one consistent light source, um, you know, figuring out how the shadow shapes kind of fall and, you know, having a dark and light area, mm -hmm. and what kind of areas you want to emphasize and how to do that. So mainly with value or with chroma, right? Yeah. So we can talk about that too. Yeah. And then the setup, because it sounds like you need to have a like background and like a professional setup, but I guess. <laughs> Honestly, you really don't. Like my yeah. studio setup is pretty basic. Um, I often take photos during the day in front of a window. Mm -hmm. so I think like, I like using natural lighting as much as possible because it gives more of a natural look to your model. So even if you take photos outside, um, yeah, but I, I think doing that, you, you have to develop a, a sort of a sense of like, what kind of color temperature you want to like, are you painting a warm painting? Maybe if then you can take photos outside during sunset where the light is little, like has a glow to it. Do you want to take paintings that have, or like, do you want to execute paintings that have more of a cool, I don't know, like a cool aspect to it or like a cool color palette. And, and in that case, maybe you take your photos during, um, like in the afternoon when it's, you know, in a blue sky, um, in the, like maybe next to like, you know, at two or three o'clock in the afternoon next to a window. So there's different ways of choosing your light source too, and still using natural lighting. So you, you definitely don't need to invest in all of this, like super professional equipment. If you want to take like good reference photos and especially now, like camera phones too, can even take such good reference photos. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I do have like a, a Canon camera, so I did invest in, sort of like a semi-professional camera, at least mm -hmm. for, for my purposes, which take really good photos and, and video too. Um, but I definitely think you, you are not limited if you don't want to invest too much money, uh, into your equipment. Like you're definitely not limited, um, to take good photos and especially good reference photos. Yeah. Yeah. yeah good to hear. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I know it's hard. And then I mean, and then if you're used to using Photoshop or any photo editors, like you can always pop in your reference photo and start playing with color and value, right? Yeah. So that's a tool that you can use to adjust your photos, even if like, you know, maybe you didn't quite get the right, you know, coloration that you wanted or that, that, uh, yeah. Yeah. I guess if people are interested, that's something we can talk about in the- A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. And I'll, I can share all my equipment that I have too. I do have like one, like I, I have, um, like a, a round light as well, like a sort of a, an Instagram light, um, mm -hmm. that, that I use sometimes, um, and then I can adjust the color temperature on it. So that's a good tool. And I think it costs probably like 60 or $70 on Amazon. So again, like you don't have to invest, you know, thousands of dollars into good camera equipment in order yeah. to take proper reference photos. Mm -hmm. yeah all right I think we are approaching the time and then just remind people uh your group is starting March 6th so repeating every I think that's every Tuesday that's that right? right uh every Wednesday evening every Wednesday right yeah and uh yeah every Wednesday evening and uh yeah if you have any questions feel free to reach out to uh Yu Ting or me um and yeah, I'd be happy to share um, any more information about um, Mastrius too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, looking forward to it. It's yeah, uh, it. yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to it too. Yeah.
And uh, yeah, thanks so much, Yuting, again, for for uh, helping me host this class. And uh, yeah, um, I, I'm so looking forward to, to working with you. Yeah, I can tell like you have a whole well of knowledge just waiting there. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Robin. Okay. Have a good night. Thank you. You too. Yeah. Bye. Bye.